Israeli Defense Forces sent an urgent video message. They were sending a message to the people of Gaza, to the northern part of Gaza. They were asking them to move to the south. It was so interesting. At that time, there was no internet connection in Gaza. The first question came to my mind, how are they going to find out what the Israelis are talking about? The second question is, why the message is in English if they're sending to people of Gaza? The third one, they were asking to people to move from the north to the south. It's a temporary move. After that, they can get back. WikiLeaks published a verified document from Israeli Ministry of Intelligence on October 13, suggesting forced displacement of Gaza civilians to Egypt would yield positive and long-term strategic results. The advisory document envisions a three-stage process, including establishment of 10 cities in Sinai in Egypt and opening a humanitarian corridor, followed by construction of cities in northern Sinai in Egypt, which there would be no return to Gaza. What's your take on this? First of all, the one I couldn't possibly forget, uh, they did it in English for the same reason we did so many announcements in Baghdad in English. We wanted the Americans to hear it. We didn't want the Arabs to understand it. Uh, think about that for a moment. This whole operation, as I have watched it unfold from a distance to be sure, from a military perspective, and after all, I'm a military professional, has been an absolute disaster. Whether you're looking at the way they're handling public relations or the way, as you've just depicted, they're handling the evacuation of non-combatants, that's what I'll call them, civilians, men, women, children, and so forth from the area, or whether it's just their all overall plan, which is very difficult to, as you just depicted with the business of Egypt and pushing Palestinians into Egypt, maybe Sinai, but into Egypt proper. I'm not so sure that they're even operating on a sane sheet of music because the Egyptians have said, you want to jeopardize the treaty you have with us? Push those Palestinians onto us. And oh, by the way, don't try to tell us that you're going to let them go back or you're going to take them back or you're going to move them back because we know you're not. And when you know their inclination is probably at least some of them not to go back because look at what we got in Jordan. Look at what we already have in Egypt in terms of Palestinians, though the Sudanese are giving the Egypt Egyptians an even bigger problem right now. But they don't want any more. Bottom line, they don't want any more people coming across their border. They got enough. Thank you very much. But let's back up for a moment. Let's look at what uh, uh, Rear Admiral Daniel Agari said. He's the, and this is this is interesting too, Rear Admiral is the spokesman for the idea. Hmm, have they been studying John Kirby and the National Security Council in the United States? Have they been understanding that Navy officers don't present the kind of image that ground officers present? Are they trying to shape their men? Of course they are. But here's what he said, and I'm quoting. Everything's going according to plan. I get really leery as a military professional when I hear that. Every time I would hear my students say that in a war game, I would stop the game. And I would say, wrong. That's not what you want to tell people. Are you accomplishing your mission? Not is everything going according to plan. Plans don't last past the first bullet being fired. Patton, Clausewitz, Marshall, Eisenhower. No plan outlasts contact with the enemy. So here you are up here. You're the spokesman for the IDF, and you're saying everything is going according to plan. That tells me nothing except you're stupid or you're trying subterfuge on me. I don't like either one. Are they accomplishing their mission? Then you got you got to say, well, what is the mission? And this comes to some of your question. Is the mission to kill everybody in sight? They don't want that to be the mission that the world sees although that looks a lot like what they've seen to this point. Do you want to just get Hamas? And if you want to just get Hamas, how are you going to do it? And what forces are, are you going to use to do it? I've got a real opening comment for them. Bombs from airplanes do not get gorillas. <laughs> what bombs from airplanes do is rubble the landscape so the gorillas have even better opportunity to ambush you when you do put ground troops in, even armored troops. In fact, armored troops are even more vulnerable because of IEDs and the impact they can have on a whole crew, killing the whole crew in the tank or the APC. So 
the question, the huge question in my mind is, what the hell is your strategy? I don't see any strategy. I just see various tactics, including bombing from the air, including rolling a few tanks in, including a few patrols going in, including a few people talking about going into the tunnels and using these kind of bombs or these kind of bombs. I don't see anything but tactics being displayed. There's no strategy. The first thing I would ask that spokesman for the idea is what is your strategic purpose? And then I would say to him after he lied to me, no doubt, probably in English too, I would say, okay, that's a strategic purpose fraught with problems because you're not going to achieve it. Because what he's going to tell me is the extermination of Hamas or as much as they possibly can. You're not going to achieve that. Hamas will come back and back and back and back. As long as you do, as Gidon Levy said, you have an open air concentration camp for two, three, four million Palestinians and worse. And you conduct pogroms on the West Bank with Ben Gavir and his boys and the settlers killing Palestinians every day. You're, they're going to come back. So what, in, what on earth is Israel's strategic objective? Just to kill people? To periodically mow the grass, which is what they say. Is that what you're doing? If that's what you're doing, let me tell you what your strategy is going to produce. A pariah. You're going to produce a state that everyone in the world despises. Even your own people in the world. Even Jews in America. Even Jews in Brazil. Even Jews in Germany are going to despise you. Not just you, Netanyahu. They already despise you. But everything that Israel stands for. That's what you're going to achieve strategically. Now, are you happy with that? Is everything going according to plan? That's a disaster. About two years ago, and I was reminded of this when I testified before the subcommittee in the Senate for personnel and ethics under Elizabeth Warren. Rick Scott, the, the ranking minority member there, he didn't ask me a thing about generals going through the revolving door and ethics at the Pentagon, which was the subject of the hearing. He spent his entire opening time remarks, five plus minutes, accusing me of being anti-Netanyahu, anti-Israel. And it didn't have anything to do with the subject of the hearing. He just wanted to get his words in. Well, he quoted me from two years ago when I said Israel won't be a state in 20 years. Want to look at it again, Rick? Want to look at it again, U.S. Congress? Israel is walking a line right now that I would say is reinforcing my view that they will not be a constituted state in 20 years. Now, less than that, I would say. You're destroying yourself. You are going to make yourself such a pariah in the world. And Netanyahu said, when people say that to him, he has said, I don't care. I don't care if the world hates me as long as Israel is safe. I don't care if the world hates me. That's not a tenable, tenable position for a state especially one in the Levant position as Israel is, to take, even if it's got the United States behind it. Here's the second thing I want to talk about militarily. John Mearsheimer spoke to this in Australia. I don't agree with John that war with China is inevitable, but look at what Biden has done now. He has got us bogged down financially in a war in Ukraine that he can't back out of, and now he's got us bogged down financially and maybe even militarily in a war at the eastern end of the Mediterranean in the Middle East. Holy mackerel, where's the real threat if there is a threat to the United States of America? It's nowhere near either of these places. It's in Asia. That's where the other peer power that is soon going to equal us in almost every component of strategic power economic, military, and otherwise, lives. <laughs> and here we are, bogged down in Europe in a no-win situation. Russia's going to win that one. And oh, by the way, what else have we done? Mearsheimer told his Australian audience, we forced Beijing and Moscow together. There are three superpowers in the world today, in this order, U.S., China, Russia. China coming hard on the U.S., Russia involved in a war. What did we do with the other two? We put them together, Xi Jinping and Putin, uh, to the point where Putin may be giving Xi Jinping plutonium so he can build out his nuclear complex faster because plutonium is faster than uranium. This is absurd. 
So two powers in the world right now have no strategy whatsoever, the United States and Israel. There you said something so interesting that Nanya who said that I don't care how the world feels about me as long as Israelis are safe. Do you see anything out of this conflict right now is going on in Israel that would be a safe future for Israelis? I see this as repeated again and again and again with each time Israel losing more credibility, more stature, more international stature in particular. The only thing saving them right now, and I hate to say this, is filthy lucre. They had a booming economy. A lot of people were making money off of it. They had the Turks interested. They had the Russians interested. Now all of that is, you know, fading away a bit. Um, it'll come back because we are filthy lucre people in this world. <laughs> we want that money. And, and, the, and the Israelis are no different from the Americans or from the Russians or anyone else. But each time it comes back, it's going to come back with less potency, less statehood, less respect in the world, less joy in the world about your being in the world. And there'll be a pariah. There'll be an absolute pariah. Netanyahu will go to jail. He's going to jail. His wife's going to jail. He's going to be thrown out of office. And Israel will be sitting there, still the same country, with the same enemies, with the same problems, and the incredibly difficult, if not impossible, capacity to do anything real about it. Peace is the only answer. One state democratically ruled, not a Jewish state, one state democratically ruled with both peoples, indeed all peoples, as most democracies are supposed to be in it, or two states living side by side in peace, or if necessary, with a UN force in between them for 75 years to keep them from killing each other. Um, those are the only two solutions that could bring peace and the only strategies that will bring peace. This is just going to repeat itself. Oh, how long do you have to do this? Isn't 50 plus years enough? George Bush told Ariel Sharon in the Oval Office in 2004, over to you, Prime Minister Sharon, nothing's worked in all this time. Well, Mr. President, why, why hasn't it worked? You take over now. Well, they took over, and their strategy is to kill all the Palestinians they can kill and get rid of them. That's their strategy. It is not going to work. If Netanyahu decides to go in underground, go into Gaza, do you think that the American troops going to be with the Israelis? The only thing U.S. troops would do is what they did in Iraq and Afghanistan, screw up majorly and, and make, make it even worse than it is. Here's where the U.S. troops are probably... A positive, but only in a tactical, maybe an operational sense. That's those carriers in the Eastern Med, or the one and the other one steaming still, I think. Hezbollah has to look at that. If Hezbollah opens a second front, then all bets are off for Israel even being able to handle the conflict on their own, particularly if Hezbollah were to enter it full force. So... Nasrallah and Hezbollah have lost their esteem amongst the, Lib uh, the Lebanese. I was looking at the polls this morning. The Lebanese people are down to less than 35, 40% support for Hezbollah now. I mean, they don't have much support for anybody anymore. I don't blame them because they've made such a mess of their country. But they certainly don't have that much support for him. And the other poll item that really struck my interest was they were asked, would they support Hezbollah attacking Israel? Absolutely not, because they know what Israel will do. They'll drop bombs all over civilians and everything else. That's what the Israelis always do. Okay, let's take this opportunity to further destroy Lebanon's economy, the only other country in the Mediterranean that were it left alone might compete with us. Don't ever forget that. So we'll bomb industry and everything else. And They don't want that to happen. Those poor people have had hell unleashed on them. They don't want that to happen. So Hezbollah is stuck here. But if they should decide, if they should make the decision to enter the fray in a big way, the U.S. will enter the fray too, I guarantee you, because Israel can't handle it. Those carriers will start hitting Hezbollah targets. Um, that's, I, I think that's just the nature of the tactical and operational situation. Then we're in for a penny, in for a pound, as I said before. What does, what does Iran do then? What do the other Arab countries do then? 
Um, this is, could get really dangerous quickly. And as I said before, as Mearsheimer said in Australia to his Australian audience, this is crazy. The, the number one superpower in the world, fast losing power, is focused on brush fire wars and not focused on the fact that there's a big country over there that's getting bigger and more powerful every day. And the only way, probably, I don't agree with John that war is inevitable. I've talked to him about it. <laughs> he thinks war is inevitable. Rising power and, and status quo power, even status quo power, losing power, that's an inevitability in his lexicon. They are going to fight. But I think there's a way to keep that fight from happening. One is talking and, and not closing off from one another. And the other is to keep our powder dry so that the Chinese don't believe that in a brush, you know, Taiwan, whatever it might be, they could win and win quickly. Um, and we're not doing that. We're, we're If I were the Chinese and I was a, a Chinese strategist, I would just be rubbing my hands together. And I would say, look, look at what the United States is doing. First of all, it's spending its, its money, which it doesn't have, in Ukraine in a losing proposition. Second, it's over there threatening everybody in the Eastern Mediterranean to try and defend its little state that doesn't know what it's doing, has no strategy other than to kill people and a lot of innocent people in the, in the lurch. Uh, this is wonderful for us. We don't even have to fight them. They're going to spin themselves to death. They're going to waste their own power so badly we won't even have to fight them. Um, it would be absolutely joyous for me if I were a Chinese strategist and I saw what was happening. Plus, I've got Moscow now. I've probably got Moscow in a way that Beijing never thought, at least not in the short term, it would ever have Moscow. Uh, so we have compelled them to go into a tacit alliance, which in pro probably includes sharing nuclear ingredients so China can build out faster and perhaps other things too. We forced them together. Meanwhile, we've got Erdogan sitting there making statements that make me think that he's trying to figure out which side to line up on eventually. And he's a NATO member. Remember my statement about NATO will dissolve? Um, it's falling apart. It's all falling apart. And it's mainly because we're not paying attention to where we should be, what we should be doing, and how we should be doing it. What we're seeing right now is Israel is not going to back down. They're going to attack more and more. When it ends, how do you see the aftermath of these events? Is Israel going to be in a better position, in a weaker position? Is there any calculation in the mind of the Netanyahu administration taking into account what would we face after these attacks on Gaza? Nope. To answer your question directly, I don't think there's anything like that going on. And in fact, I think that's one of the primary reasons I would say get, I don't think, I know. It's one of the primary reasons I'd get rid of Netanyahu. You need a government in there that's one, clean as much as it can be. Two, has no trappings around it for pogroms in the West Bank and so forth. And three, and most importantly, a government that can think clearly without the rage and the embarrassment, which must be just driving BB nuts because he thought he was king of the walk. He thought he was king of the world, and he wasn't. He was proven to have clay feet. You need someone in there who can deal with the kind of diplomacy and the kind of negotiation that needs to go on for a ceasefire and a cessation of hostilities and a restoration of whatever is going to come afterwards. And you need someone who can think about that, too. What do you want to come afterwards? What do you want to govern Gaza? You can't say, go thee to Egypt. Go lead to the Sinai. Leave. We're going to make this a desert and we're going to mine it and bomb it forever and ever and ever. That's crazy. That's crazy. And oh, by the way, we probably do need to sit down and really talk seriously with the United States, with Europe, with the UN, with the Palestinians, very importantly, and with others with a vested interest in this, including probably eventually the Gulf states, about two states or a single state that's a democracy. I don't think you're going to get that. So I'd go for the two states separated, you know, with a wall, with UN troops, whatever. Hell, I'd be willing to put U.S. forces in there. Uh, no one wants to do that, of course, because the U.S. Army just doesn't do that very well. Um, but 
you got to do something to change the situation. You can't do what you've been doing for 70 plus years. You just can't. You can't continue to fulfill the Joint Chiefs of Staff and General George Marshall's objections to recognizing Israel in 1948, which have come to pass big time. You can't keep fulfilling the conditions to keep that going on. It's unsustainable. So you've got to take a different road. And you need a new government to take a different road. You and need the image in the global community, too, of a new government. And you need that image in the minds of the Israeli people, the bulk of them, whom you want to vote for this new government and vest it with the power that they've given it through that vote and with the change that they want. And they've got to want it. They've got to want it. And they've got to be for peace for once instead of war. This Israeli-Palestinian confederation that we ran this last Sunday, we had a couple of people on there who were, uh, shall I say, BB lovers. And all you have to do is listen to one of them for an extended period of time to know that get thee behind me, Satan, go away. Let the good Israelis, let the good government be formed, let the good Israelis back it, and let's have peace for the first time since 1948. That's the only way you're going to get out of this. Now, there are lots of interests that don't want that to happen. There are a lot of people making money off this, just like they're making money off Ukraine. You know, all the defense contractors, that whole complex, they're, uh, they're salivating over this. They go to shareholder meetings and tell their shareholders, man, business is good. So you got a lot of, a lot of the objections to doing this sort of thing. But you've got to do it if you want to have any kind of stability in the region at all. What's your take on what has happened to the Secretary General of the UN? He was attacked because he was saying something so obvious. This conflict didn't come out of vacuum. It shows how degenerated is our conversation. Even if it's just, it doesn't have to be formal diplomacy. You could just be talking on the floor of the UN Security Council. And, and all of a sudden you're attacked, you know, mercilessly attacked. And it's all because you're an anti-Semite. Oh, my God. I think it was Jonathan Shanker long ago, at least seven years ago, who said, you know, we've used that so much that it doesn't mean anything anymore. Right. It doesn't. Because we're not anti-Semitic. We're anti-Netanyahu. We're anti-war. We're anti all the things that you stand for, Bibi and Ben Gavir and your whole rotten crew of Nazis. We're sick of you. Sick to death. Get thee gone. That's, you know, and, and Guterres was just saying what half the world or better feels. And I I have to say, you know, I, I was sort of there when we were selecting the new Secretary General, and we had the New Zealander who was just just top drawer. I mean, she cleaned her segment of the UN out, got rid of the corruption and everything else. And then we made sure she didn't get to the top post and that he did. Well, I hope we're re regretting that a little bit now because <laughs> he, he showed a little bit of courage. We've seen that the U.S. and Israel on one side and the other countries on the other. Even Europeans didn't vote in favor of Israel. It's pitiful to watch. I mean, it really is. We're, we're such a pariah ourselves um, when we take these positions. And we have done so so many times in the past that uh, I can tell you that military officers used to just turn their faces away from the TV screen whenever there was a vote and we were watching it or whatever. Um, there might be a whole bunch of people in Israel who'd be surprised to know that the uh, much of the military leadership, at least when I was there, may have changed, but I don't think so. Much of the military leadership, including my old boss, Colin Powell, thought our relationship with Israel was the stupidest thing we did. Thought it was just absurd. It did more damage to us internationally. It did more damage to us, really, in terms of the money. Uh, Rich Armitage, who would manage the budget for us at State, would come back from a budget meeting and he would say, well, we gave $3.5 billion to Israel and $3.2 billion to Egypt to bribe them to keep the peace treaty with Israel, and we have $400 million left for U.S. diplomacy. <laughs> and then you put international military education and training in there, I met, and maybe we had $100 million left for U.S. diplomacy. 
How stupid is that? How did you find the reaction that you've seen from the Arab states so far? I think they're doing what <laughs> Colin Powell used to say about the Arabs. They look at the horse race, and when one pulls out, they put their money on that one. And when another one pulls out, they take their money off that one and put it on that one. They're waiting to see what happens. And they have let certain points come out. Like, for example, if the killing is too bad, that is to say Israel just wipes Gaza out, then we're going to have a real problem holding our Arab people down the way we like to keep them quiescent and, and, and not a threat to us. So we're going to have to do something. And what we're going to do is probably break off relations. We're going to stop all the things we've been doing that are diplomatic initiatives with Israel. And maybe even we might marshal a few uh, tanks and a few airplanes in places and look like we're going to be uh, you know, a spoiler here. That's not good either. And yet that's the kind of thing that Israel, with this current tactic of just killing people, is generating. That's the kind of atmosphere they're generating. They cannot do these sorts of things in isolation. They always have an impact on the region and the world. And they don't seem to understand that anymore, partly because Netanyahu is, I think he believes that. He doesn't give a damn about the rest of the world. All he cares about is staying out of jail and staying in power. Well, both, he has failed now, I think. He's going to jail. He's going to be kicked out of power. But my big question is, what's the unity government has, has generated a better situation in Israel, for sure. People aren't quite as angry as they were. Um, but that unity government is not going to endure. What's going to replace it, and how are they going to act with regard to the aftermath of what's coming, because there will be the day after. And the day after right now looks like it's going to be bloody as hell with an isolated Israel, probably uh, well short of its goal of wiping out Hamas. I'll say absolutely short of its goal of wiping out Hamas. And faced with nothing in Gaza but a few Palestinians and a whole bunch of people hovering around the edges, no one to rule it, no one to govern it. Now, what do you do? They have no strategy. Erdogan won this, the latest election in his country with a little margin. Right now, it's a boost for his position. And the other thing that Turkey is so strategic, so important for this conflict, we know that 40% of the oil of Israel comes from Azerbaijan and goes through Turkey and then to Israel. This is so important in terms of energy. And the other thing, the U.S. nuclear weapons are stored in Turkey. How dangerous this conflict can get if anything goes the, the wrong direction? Well, there's so many components to any answer to that question. <laughs> One is that Erdogan has been buying with Mohammed bin Salman in particular, but the entire Gulf state complex for leadership of the Muslim world. He also buys with the group in Tehran, but they really lost so much legitimacy when they cracked down so hard on the women and the others in Iran who were revolting. Um, but I don't think Erdogan is all that concerned about the leadership of the Muslim world falling to the mullahs in Tehran. He is concerned about the Gulf, and the Gulf now is very concerned about him because he's got the leg up now. He was sort of tied with MBS and the rest of the people. But now I think he's got, and he's using this, he's using this conflict to cement that leadership of the Muslim world. And he doesn't care if it's the Muslim Brotherhood. Ooh, did they start in Turkey? Or more moderate Muslims. He wants the leadership of the Muslim world. He'll do it however he can do it. One way to do it is now take on Israel in a big frontal way. Turkey is so key to Ukraine in a way I mean, it's key to the Black Sea. It's key to that those waterways through there, which are so important. It's key to Ukraine, whatever's left of Ukraine after the Russians get through their future. It's key to, as you said, not just the Tbilisi Chehan, what is it, uh, Chehan pipeline, which is what about four four million barrels a day or something like that. It's a lot, um, and the pipelines that. Why are our troops still in Syria? Why are our troops still? They're looking for ISIS. The hell they are. 
they're there protecting a pipeline which pumps discounted oil, discounted price oil to Haifa in Israel. They, they've been there for that. that. That's one of the reasons we did the 2003 invasion of Iraq was to ensure Israel continued to get this discounted oil. They were getting it before through Mark Rich, you may recall that billionaire bum, he was busting Saddam Hussein, Saddam Hussein sanctions in the UN oil for food program and shipping that oil to Israel at discounted prices. Netanyahu's time as finance minister, his time as prime minister, successful economically, was largely due to that. Uh, Scooter Libby, who was the vice president, Dick Cheney's chief of staff, made $4 million off of Mark Rich being his lawyer. This goes back a long way. It isn't going to stop anytime soon. But your, your point about oil is right, and your point about the central strategic location of Turkey is critical. And now it's very difficult to me to say that Turkey is a responsible member of the NATO alliance. Very difficult. Um, I think he's wrestling with these decisions every day. Do I go totally independent and neutral? Do I stay in NATO without any prospect ever of getting into the EU, which was really one of the reasons I was staying in NATO? Or do I line up with the other axis in the world? What's the other axis in the world? It's rapidly becoming Moscow and Beijing. Or do I just want to be the champion of the Islamic world and stay completely neutral and independent? He kind of goes back and forth, it seems, in his public statements and so forth. He tacks really well with events in the world, but all of that is tactical. I don't see a large strategy coming out of, a, of Ankara yet. Maybe I will soon. Um, and maybe that's because of the geographical location. It's a difficult location for him too, because he does have his fingers in so many pies as it were. And he does have the ability to influence so many critical things in a, in a critical region of the world. I think John Mearsheimer again is right. Europe is fading in terms of the, if you want to say the Mackinder idea of what you don't want to have dominated by uh, a hostile power. It's rapidly becoming the Far East. It's rapidly becoming Northeast Asia, Korea, Japan, and China. And I think that shift has got Erdogan confused too. I mean, after all, we're talking about Asia. You know, people forget Asia goes a long way. Iran is in Asia. Uh, people say, well, Iran's in Asia? Yes, Iran is in Asia. Um, that's a whole different ballgame, but it's a huge shift that John, I think, has got right, John Mearsheimer, and that we're paying very little attention to other than rhetorically. We talk about pivots. We talk about moving forces. We talk. Look at where our forces are right now, and look at who we're supporting right now. Look at the wars we're involved in right now. Does that look to you like Asia in the real sense? No, it's not. Me I'm, saying, I'm not saying we should go to war with China. I, I'm the last. I, I disagree with John on that. I think it can be prevented. It can be prevented by good diplomacy and by being strong and, and, and not appearing weak and not allowing alliances to form against us like Moscow and Beijing. But are we doing that? Nope. John's right there. So we're asking for the war. Larry, in your opinion, what would be the solution for the U.S. foreign policy to manage these disagreements that are happening in Israel? I don't have the kind of uh, substantive faith in the Blinken, Sullivan, Biden, Campbell, Newland, whomever we want to throw in their team. I, I just don't see the talent there. I, and I don't see the interest there. I, I see what Colin Powell used to call managing the inbox. That is to say, whatever's in your inbox on that given 24-hour period you're dealing with. I don't see any foresight. I don't see any strategy. I don't see... They can talk about the Abraham Accords all day long. That happened not because of them, but despite them. Um, they can talk about other things that they've done. In, in most cases, that's the case with that, too. Uh, Ukraine is a... Support for Ukraine is a colossal waste of money, a colossal waste of life, Ukrainian life and Russian life. Um, this looks like it's going to be a colossal waste of life. And here's another point. Israel's going to take some significant casualties if they go in there with any kind of sound tactical plan on the ground. I don't care how sound it is. They're going to take a lot of casualties. And when you talk about a country that can give 6,000 prisoners for one Israeli captive, you're talking about 
a country that really can't absorb casualties like that. Look at what's happened with regard to October the 7th. Um, I think they're looking for a real rat show and they don't, they're not going to know what to do about it. And that's another problem they've got. The tactical part of their plan, if you want to call it a plan, is going to fall apart on them. Um, where are we going to be when all this happens? That's an excellent question. Are we going to be joining the fight just to keep them from going down the pipe? Uh, how will we join the fight? Will we just do it clandestinely or will we, will we do it openly? I think we might do it openly, as I suggested, if Hezbollah decides to enter the fray. And then what does Iran do? Um, as you suggested with your question, this is, uh, we've got so many things in the world right now that could spin out of control and become real, regional, and then perhaps even uh, partially global conflicts. We've got Kursk, the nuclear reactor at Kursk. Who attacked that? Was that the Iranian or, or was that the uh, Ukrainians, uh, as the Russians are saying? Or did the Russians do that? They are they're, they're saying that the Russians had attacked another nuclear reactor. This is dangerous stuff, too. And all this is still going on. And uh, I, I'm, I'm looking through AOL this morning. And, you know, you're going bing, bing. And I hear, ooh, war in the East, Gaza. Uh, and the next thing is uh, the New York Times talking about some actor who died. And then the next thing, that's us. You know, we have the concentration of a mouse. We, we can't focus on anything in the world and, and bring it to some kind of successful conclusion. So we just manage our inbox. So you're asking me if the Blinken Biden team can do more than manage its inbox. I don't think so. And that's scary. On top of that, you've got them increasingly focused on the domestic political situation in this country and getting reelected. And that's going to become like a laser focus. It always does. And as Trump's situation maybe evolves negatively or positively, or someone else appears on the scene, it's going to get worse. And then it's going to be the sole focus of this administration. There'll be, you know, these things will be on the back burner. They won't look that way in the media, but they will be for the White House. It'll be catch up each day. They won't even be managing their inbox very well because they're looking at the election. This is not a good time. Not a good time. Dangerous think, time. Dangerous time. Do you think that the Biden administration is able to put some pressure on the Netanyahu administration to reconsider their plan in Gaza? I think they've tried, from what I'm hearing. Um, they've had some moderate success, as you're seeing, because I think the original plan was to just go hell bent and you know kill everything in sight they're now down to a better tactical plan in my view it's more methodical it's more careful it is trying to avoid excessive civilian casualties mostly by forcing everyone out so there's no one to kill <laughs> except maybe the hamas that stay back in the tunnels or whatever but it, it, we have had some impact i think i want to see the government go i i don't agree with this idea that You've got to keep Netanyahu there because it's war and you don't want to get rid of him in war. He needs to go. And the rest of those nuts in his administration need to go. They need to clean house. If they can't clean their political house at the same time, they are doing a methodical step-by-step -step tactical operation in Gaza, then they're, they're just like us. They can't handle two. They can't walk and chew gum at the same time. Uh, they need to get rid of that government. They need to get rid of Netanyahu. He needs to go to jail, uh, and whoever needs to go with him. And then maybe uh, maybe Gantz could take over the whole thing, or or maybe they'll have uh, maybe they'll set some new elections or whatever. They seem to be you know able to do elections on a drop of a dime. Let's have another election, uh, or let's just put the unity govern government in there minus Netanyahu. I think that would be a cleansing act that would help Israel immeasurably, both on the global scene, because I don't know anyone that cares a whit about Bibi Netanyahu. And I know a whole lot of people who despise him, including the majority of American Jews. So go, get thee behind me, Satan, go away. And let's have somebody else, let's give a whole new, healthy, clean appearance 
to Jerusalem as much as is possible before we start the you know, worst aspects of this, what could be a slaughter. How do you see the risk of having a war between the U.S. and Israel on one side and Iran on the other side? You got to think about Russia in there because Russia is, for all of its being bogged down to a certain extent uh, in its uh, defense in Ukraine, Russia's still got significant assets and worries about Syria, for example. I think one reason you see Russia not doing anything with regard to Syria that might be counter to Netanyahu's interest is because he realizes that it would be extremely distracting for him to have to take on yet another problem in Syria. So he is, to this point anyway, allowing Netanyahu and the Israeli Air Force to attack targets in Syria that look like they're supposedly look like they're backed by Iran, fueled by Iran, resupplied by Iran, maybe even our Quds Force fighters or whatever. Um, but Russia's got a game to play here with Assad, with Iran, with uh, the other assets that are in Syria, like ours, and with his relationship in the Middle East, with Syria being the last real foothold he has. So, you know, this, this uh, thing that uh, this incident that just happened in uh, Dagestan, I'm not sure how to interpret that, but the anti-Semitism aspect of it seemed to be quite bright. Um, and I think we're looking at what my Jewish friends all across America are telling me, Bibi Netanyahu is the greatest motivation to anti-Semitism in the world. We're looking at this prospect of that happening. And we're looking at the prospect of, we still got, for example, I think this last 11 months or so, 60,000 more Russians immigrated to Israel. So he hadn't, he hadn't turned that off either. So he's kind of walking this, this tightrope between being so engaged in Ukraine at the same time having other theaters that he has to worry about other regions and at the same time worrying about his relationship with Xi Jinping and how that goes. I, I wouldn't want their problems either, but we're making their problems easier to solve. I mean, by our preoccupation with these two conflicts and the stance we've taken in both of them, we're making Xi Jinping's and Putin's problems easier to solve, easier to handle. And that's not probably what we should be doing, as Mir Shamer is pointing out. What's the strategy of attacking Iran? What they're seeking for, in your opinion? You mean people like John Bolton, who's all over John YouTube? Bolton, yeah. Lindsey Graham? They, they, they just, they can't get it out of their system. They simply can't get out of their system. I think it's as basic as going back to Iran, took those hostages and kept them, put a president in limbo, uh, and indeed got him unelected, Jimmy Carter, 440, 44 days, I guess it was. Um, and, and they won't pay back. They won't pay back. Plus they're just neoconservatives and neoconservatives never met anybody out in the world they didn't want to bomb at one time or another. They're the most warmongering group of people I've ever run into in my life. And Bolton is the top of that list. So they just want to take Iran on. They think Iran is the ultimate enemy of Israel. That's part of it too. So if you can if you can get rid of Syria and get rid of Iran, we fail miserably in Syria. It's still there, but it's a basket case. Israel can attack it almost at will. If you can get rid of Iran, you've got no problems left. Israel is safe forever. You know, they, they, oh, we've got the Abraham Accords on the other side of the Gulf. Ah, okay. That's their plan. That's been their plan for a long time. Um, it's absurd in my mind. They want the Middle East in turmoil, perpetual turmoil, so Israel will be protected from its potential enemies or those enemies defeated roundly. Then you ask yourself a question, as I did of one of them. Who's going to rule Iran? Certainly, we're not going to occupy it and rule it. That would be insane. insane. Who's going to rule it? Well, Democrats. Okay. Do you think Democrats? Let's say you get a Jeffersonian Democrat. Let's say you put those women in Iran in charge. Do you think their strategic and national interests would change? They would still have the same potential enemies. They would still have the same potential threats. They would still have the same potential need for armaments like their missiles and so forth. What's going to change? Well, the Democrats would be our friends. What makes you think that? Do we look like we like Arabs? Do we look like we deal with Arabs well? 
Do we look like we deal with anybody in that region well? Indeed, do we look like we deal with anybody in the world well anymore? What makes you think that's going to change Iran? It's crazy to think that all of a sudden you get a regime change in Tehran and it's no longer theocratic, which would be, I think, somewhat difficult because the follow-on regime, we're going to have some Islamic trappings too, probably. Um, what makes you think that's going to change their national interests? They're crazy. These people are crazy. John Bolton's crazy. I, I, I work with John Bolton. He's crazy. The other thing that we've seen in the Putin's manner toward the conflict in Israel, he's not that Putin that we've known before the conflict in Ukraine, because it's so much changed with this conflict in Ukraine. He changed his view toward Israel because Israel start backing Ukraine against Russia. In Russia, we have Chechnya, who are Muslims. We have Dagestan, who are Muslims. These are a significant part of the Russian military. It's so very powerful, very important part. If you remember during that Pergosian mutiny, we had these Chechnya forces, 25,000 forces ready to destroy Pergosian. You see how they're connected together. How do you see the complexity of Russia considering what's going on in Israel? Well, they've always had this complexity, even when the czars were in charge with the, the different kind of populations that were on their periphery. Stalin tried to deal with it by moving them all around all over the place and keeping them so confused or dead in the gulag that they weren't a threat anymore. They're back. Putin seems to me to be a pretty good chess master, though. I mean, he's playing from a very weak position. You could say that he lost both his knights, both his bishops. He only has his queen and king and maybe one rook, but a group of pawns. And he's playing rather masterfully with him, but he's playing because his opponent on the other side of the table is an idiot, namely Washington and London, and a lot of the people arrayed around Washington and London. I think those people, as I've said before, are getting ready to split, but maybe it'll take them a little while longer. Um, he's playing from a weak hand, but he's playing to a strong strategy. That strategy's first pillar is to finish the thing in Ukraine successfully and get a good deal out of it. I think he's going that way. I think he's happy with where he, not happy, but he's content with where he is right now. His second goal probably was to use what's happening to us and with us in the world to get an alliance with Xi Jinping, the most powerful country in the world next to us, and soon to surpass us, I suspect, in this decade in purchasing power parity and other measures they already have. And then thirdly, he wants to remain a power in areas where the Soviets had power, like Syria, as long as possible and remain an influence in the world. In other words, as Mearsheimer says, there are three superpowers. They are in order, U.S., China, and Russia. Russia's at the bottom right now, but they are coming back to a certain extent. He wants, he wants that, uh, that status again. And from such a weak chess hand, he's done a pretty, pretty good job. And I, I don't care for Putin. I don't care for his tactics. But I have to do, I have to say, I do admire the way he's playing our mistakes and turning them into positive for Russia. Uh, he, did, he had a pretty weak hand. He's got a pretty strong hand now, if you look at the way things probably will roll out over the next decade. So that having been said, it's frightening to me that he he did something, and as I understand it, at least one house of the Duma has approved it. He's getting out of the comprehensive test plan treaty, which is really the the last element of real importance in the nuclear weapons treaty complex. Does that mean he's going to test again? Does that mean he's clearing the way for Xi to test? Because maybe if Xi's building out really fast, and he's using plutonium, and he's used to using uranium, he's going to want to test. My question would be, is he going to test underground in China? That'd be my preference. I, my preference would be he doesn't test at all. No one tests anymore at all. But if he's coming out of the CTBT, then why? Um, is he doing this for Xi Jinping? Is he doing it for himself? Whatever. It's a bad, bad sign. Is he just doing it because he doesn't want any vestiges of arms control with the United States of America remaining? Uh, I don't think he's that picky unish. 
I think he's doing it for a reason, and the reason is probably substantial. So that's scary right now. Um, and this business of Ukraine and the nuclear reactors and everybody treating it so cavalierly, we're, we're back in a world where, you know, military officers are talking again about the utility of nuclear weapons on the battlefield. And small nuclear weapons, small yield nuclear weapons, that's not a good place to be, especially not when we're so absent any kind of arms control in the world now. It's a dangerous. People don't understand this. They don't realize this. Gentleman came up to me in New York City when I was up there last week, and he said, do you know there's no one in this city that remembers bomb shelters? I said, do you know when I used to hand out a DA pamphlet, a pamphlet published by the Department of Defense, signed, as I recall, it was signed in its initial page, it was signed by Lyndon Baines Johnson, the President of the United States, Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces. It told everybody in intricate detail with photographs how to build a bomb shelter in their backyard. When I showed that to my students, they were they were mystified. Why would anybody want to do this? But okay, you're living in a world again today where that might be a relevant thing. No one cares. No one remembers what it was like. No one cares. Well, they'll care when the first nuclear weapon goes off. If something happens between the U.S. and Iran, do you think U.S. without going nuclear can sustain a war, a conventional war in that region with Iran? I don't. I did this in 1981 and two and three, I guess it was, uh, all the way up to 84 and 85. Remember when the Soviets moved into Afghanistan? Um We had a real fear in the Force Providers Unified Command, U.S. Pacific Command in Honolulu. We had a real fear that we would have to fight the Russians somewhere between Bandar Abbas and Chabahar, the two warm water ports down there at the end of the Gulf, and the border with Afghanistan. Somewhere in there, the Zagros Mountains was sort of a line we used of uh, sort of like a... a uh, repeating what Alexander the Great tried to do, but with modern armaments, we were going to try to stop the Russians coming down towards Bandar Abbas and Chabahar. The war planning got fairly substantial. Um, and a lot of us realized we don't ever want to fight in Iran. This terrain is forbidding. This terrain almost killed Alexander the Great. This terrain is not something we should want to fight in or on. And look at what we've got now. We've got almost 90 million people in this country, a country of great strategic depth, of really variable terrain and difficult terrain, as I was pointing out. How are you going to do that? You're not going to do that from the air like we did Iraq. They'll go underground, and they're good at going underground. They learn a lot of it from the North Koreans. Um, how are you going to do that? What's your plan for taking on Iran, other than to bomb the bejesus out of them and find out, as you did with Vietnam and you did with Germany, look at the post-war reports on Germany, their production actually went up, even though we dropped all those bombs on them. How are you going to do it with just airplanes? You can't. You're going to have to invade. You're going to have to occupy the country. Our army is smaller than the army of Bangladesh. Our reserve component is 40% short this year. We couldn't invade and occupy Iran if we tried. People ask me today, why didn't we put more troops in Iraq? Why didn't we put more troops in Afghanistan? We didn't have them. The new Speaker of the House, Mike Johnson, it seems that he's not willing to support Ukraine. He's focused on Israel and the conflict in Israel right now. We have Chris Christie who's talking about now we have to continue to support Ukraine. I think in the new Speaker of the House, whom I have done a really fast study of, we have what is just short of, if not an actual card-carrying, dominionist, fundamentalist, evangelical. The statements that he's made to this point, several of which were as impolitic as hell, justify my saying that even more so than my research. Why is he interested in Israel? Why are these people interested in Israel? Why is John Hagee, head of Christians United for Israel, interested in Israel. 
They're interested in Israel because they think the end times, as described in the book of Revelation, are coming. And they know that one of the conditions for those times to come, for the end of the world, is what we're talking about, to come, the rapture, is Israel in grave peril and the United States rushing to its rescue. Armageddon, others have called it. There are people who believe this. There are people who believe this in their heart of hearts. I suspect a man who believes that Noah, if you're familiar with the Old Testament, the Jewish Old Testament and Christian Old Testament now, if you believe that Noah had dinosaur, dinosaurs on the ark with him, this man funded and helped run and still is a part of, as far as I can tell from the research, two theme parks in Tennessee and Kentucky. These theme parks teach creation theory. And every day I'm told by a reputable authority that school buses with middle schoolers and elementary school children pull up to these parks and they go in and they see what this guy believes, that the earth is less than 6,000 years old, that Noah had dinosaurs on the ark with him. This is the Speaker of the House of the United States of America today. He is the third in line for the presidential succession. We already know that that can happen. Jerry Ford became president of the United States. That's a very unnerving thing for this citizen to know that we have an individual like that as the Speaker of the House of Representatives, third in line of succession for the presidency. A man who believes that Noah had dinosaurs on the ark with him. I'm not even sure Noah had an ark. I'm not even sure that the flood happened, except there's some scientific evidence that at one time, perhaps there was a big flood, but probably a little bit of climate change then too. But this is a man who believes, literally believes the book of Genesis and believes the Bible is right about the end times, the rapture and revelation and all of that. I'd be for Israel if I were him, if I were he. I mean, that's the scary aspect of these evangelicals who, who now we are finding out probably make up anywhere from 10 to 11% of the officer corps in the armed forces and probably double that of the enlisted and non-commissioned corps in the armed forces. These are people whose chaplains in the armed forces tell them their loyalty is not to the Constitution of the United States, but to Jesus, to Christ, to the church. Time magazine just published an article. Zelensky says, nobody believes in our victory like I do. Nobody. It seems that he still believes that he can win this war in Ukraine. The Biden policy in Ukraine, are they going to back down? Are they going to continue supporting and sending more weapons and funds to Ukraine? I think a lot of it is going to depend on the Hill and whether or not they can come together and craft any, any kind of support for anyone other than Israel. I never think they won't support Israel. Um, but Ukraine is going to depend heavily on that. And I think you just suggested in your previous question that the, the, the conflict between the one or the other is going to come out on Israel's side. So Zelensky is going to be hurting. He has made a couple remarks, impolitic remarks, but that he understands Israel's taking the focus off Ukraine. And he's not happy with that. But I think the focus was already off Ukraine. I think we've already under, we already understand what's happening. We just can't politically admit it because we want to get reelected if we're Joe Biden. And he can't leave that so quickly that it looks like he's retreating and he's not staying the fight, as it were. Once the bulk of the American people have decided that Russia has won, whatever that means, um, then Biden can back off. I certainly hope that that realization comes well before the election, because if we wait that long, Zelensky is going to be eaten up. Ukraine is going to be eaten up. As I said before one time on your show, I believe, I'm worried that the whole dynamics of the war might change if we suddenly have a Russia confronting Ukraine that's prostrate. I, doesn't have any more soldiers. Literally doesn't have any more soldiers. You saw the other day, I'm sure that 
um, they, they've had all these complaints from uh, mothers and other family members and everything. They don't want them taking their people for as long or as many as they've been in the past. Well, let's face it, Russia's not running out of people. Uh, Ukraine is running out of people, running out of time. And we need to have an agreement while we can still get an agreement that is at least partially favorable to Ukraine. Um, we don't want to wait until the point where we have to kind of say, uh, oh, well, you know, we've taken our off the ball here. Sorry, you're you're hurting. You're hurting and you've got to make a deal and the deal is going to be really bad. You're going to lose half your country or whatever it might be. Although I don't think I don't think Putin would want that. Uh, but you never know how much the dynamics of war might change somebody, particularly if they perceive themselves as winning after a bloodletting that has happened for two or three years. That's a dangerous situation, too. But I think his days are numbered. And here's another point. We have rank amateurs, you know, in all these capitals. It's like looking at the opposite of Winston Churchill, the opposite of Franklin Roosevelt the opposite even of the Japanese leaders and the German leaders, Hitler and his crew and, the, and Hirohito and his crew. They, they just are amateurs. They're amateurs. And, and I, I, would, I would think maybe I would watch Zelensky leave the stage mumbling under his breath and, 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 and imprecations flying and everything else and Putin marching, you know, wherever he wanted to march. This is crazy. Be like statesmen have some courage, have some heart, have some uh, faith in diplomacy. Go and talk and stop the war. Go and talk and stop the war. How hard is that to do? Well, apparently amateurs find it almost impossible. And I'm not necessarily leaving Joe Biden out of that definition. When's the last time Joe Biden sat through a war where he was responsible for it? Never. Never. You don't do that as a senator. You can pontificate all day long as a senator. You can say pretty much anything you want to, reverse it the next day, reverse that the next day. You can't do that as commander-in-chief. Well, you can, but you pay for it dearly in the end. And that's part of Biden's problem.